Okay, it's fine. We're good. Ready? Okay. Hi again. Kill me. Um, good to see everybody. Um, I guess we're fortunate ish to have uh, Adam Kaufman. No, I'm, I'm kidding. Adam is great. Uh, we're fortunate to have Adam Kaufman from uh, Dylan giving us the coupon seminar today. Uh, Adam was a, uh, an undergrad at Amherst before uh, his doctoral research. Uh, actually at Jilla with Cindy Regal doing some early experiments with manipulation of individual uh, atoms and arrays of uh, atomic freezers. He then uh, moved to Harvard and conducted his postdoctoral work studying uh, atom entanglement in many body systems and uh, uh, sort of precursors to uh, fractional quantum Hall physics in a quantum gas microscope experiment there. And uh, for the last, I don't know, how many years have you been at, at John? It's uh, really inappropriate how few years he's been there. Um, <laughs> given how many results he has to share with us. Don't tell us. It's going to make me mad. Um, he's, he's had his own group uh, uh, at CU Boulder, um, pioneering uh, quantum science with atoms in freezer arrays uh, for quantum computing and metrology and many body physics. Um, and so, uh, Adam has won all of the sort of young faculty awards. I won't go through all of those. Uh, I, I will uh, say he got the New Horizons Breakthrough Prize uh, a little while back, which is pretty awesome uh, for some of this squeezy work. So anyway, Adam, take it away. So yeah, it's been a pleasure to be here. I, I hope my like rhythm here isn't screwed up. So I'm going to be advancing with my laptop and using this laser pointer because I mean, this thing like broke on my flight over. Um, so uh, yeah, it's been awesome being here. Uh, there have been great lab tours, great discussions. And uh, uh, even though I've been here for two days, I feel like it actually was not enough time, but uh, that's how it goes. Um, so yeah, I'll be telling you about things going on in my group at Jilla over the past uh, bit of time. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, with that I'll start. Um, oh, I see the problem is that nothing. Oh, ah, now this works. Uh, very good. Okay, that was really good. Uh, okay, so uh, the, the work that my group does, and I think actually that happens at QFARM in general, falls into the broader category of quantum science, uh, by which I mean uh, using uh, quantum mechanical resources to do things that are less easy to do with classical resources alone. Uh, so this is exemplified by things like quantum communication, where you can use uh, quantum fluctuations to improve security. Uh, for quantum simulation of intractable models, classically intract intractable models, uh, quantum computing, uh, and also metrology uh, in some cases. And I actually, I wanted to put a picture here of like quantum enhanced farming, but every single time I thought of something, it was like borderline inappropriate <laughs> for a talk. So I didn't do that. Um, uh, okay. So uh, People often refer to this term quantum 2.0, uh, which I think depending on whom you speak to means something different. I'll just say in the context of this talk and sort of how I think about it, uh, uh, typically this means developing the tools to generate, maintain, control, and detect large scale entangled states, which in principle could be useful for all these things that I was just talking about in the previous slide. Um, and there are various ways of getting at this, but one particular approach that, uh, yeah, good. Uh, that uh, my group considers and a number of groups consider uh, sort of just like a basic philosophy is, you know, we can build complexity from well-controlled individual particles or qubits. So basically we start with things we like really understand and then we add more and more complexity by adding more and more of those things and stitching them together in interesting ways. Um, and so uh, there are a lot of platforms that have adopted this philosophy um, and this is an incomplete list, but uh, ranging from su superconducting qubits to trapped ion arrays, uh, and in neutrals, uh, there have been uh, sort of two prevailing platforms. One is quantum gas microscopes, where you start with some very large uh, ultra cold cloud of atoms in an optical lattice, and you can use the microscope to image those atoms, uh, and also optical tweezer arrays. Uh, and so obviously this, this talk is really gonna be focusing on neutrals, and in fact, focusing on tweezers, but um, uh, some of the things that I'll be talking about actually sort of bridge these two categories. Okay. So uh, as I just said, um, 
Am I on the camera actually? Okay. I was advised to try to stay on the camera. Okay. Uh, uh, is this optical tweezer array technology? And so the basic idea here is you have some microscope. Uh, typically, the microscope is like outside of some vacuum chamber, and so this is supposed to represent a window into that vacuum chamber. Uh, and then on the other side is ultra high vacuum, and then inside of that vacuum, you can trap single neutral atoms. Uh, and the basic idea is that by shining light into this microscope, it makes a tiny little focus, and at that focus, you can trap individual atoms. Uh, and then typically, using that same microscope uh, in the same way that's done in biology, you can do fluorescence microscopy on the single atoms and image the and image them in the traps. So this is an image of single atoms, in this case, strontium atoms from my lab at Jilla. Uh, and this is based off, like this whole field is based off pioneering work uh, from the Grandier group in Paris. Okay, uh, also stop me if people have questions that you'll like here. Um, okay, so this, this technology has been used for a variety of different things, uh, especially over the past decade, there's really been a lot of acceleration, uh, ranging from hue to many body physics, where the idea here is that by using the fact that you can make many traps and control the positions of those traps, you can make interesting models that you might want to study. Um, uh, very recently in particular, there's been a lot of advances using this, this kind of system for quantum information processing, where the basic notion is that because these microscopes give us single particle control of the, of the atoms, uh, both the state of the atom and where the atoms might live in space, uh, you can encode sort of basic circuits. Um, my group has spent a lot of time looking at whether this platform might be useful for metrology and specifically optical atomic clocks. Um, and finally, I just, I like to highlight this because I think it's really cool work. Um, at the CUA, uh, uh, they've been doing experiments where they uh, use the fact that the atoms are so well localized in the tweezers and the fact that you can move them around uh, to uh, controllably couple uh, neutral atom emitters to nanophotonic devices that have very, very small but intense uh, modes of leaking out of the structures. Okay, so um, one thrust over the past, I guess, five years uh, has uh, been sort of to push this kind of system to more complex atoms or particles. Uh, so one includes trapping uh, molecules in tweezers. Uh, this is going on, uh, this is actually an incomplete list now. Uh, this is going on at the CUA and Conco and Mies group uh, and John Doyle's group. And actually Lauren Shook has amazing recent results uh, doing this uh, recently as well. Um, uh, dual species experiments where two different uh, alkali atoms are trapped in the same tweezer arrays and you sort of leverage the different properties of those atoms to do more things than you could do with the atoms individually alone. Uh, and then finally, uh, at my group, um, at Jilla and also uh, uh, Mamwa Andres' group at Caltech and also Jeff Thompson's group at Princeton, uh, the three of us uh, a bit ago started looking at alkaline earth atoms and tweezers. Um, and this will really be the focus of this talk. Um, so uh, my group using the features of these atoms has looked at a number of different things. So we've looked at uh, quantum metrology, the idea that if you use, uh, uh, if you prepare entangled states and put it in some sort of metrological sequence, that entanglement can be used to do better measurements or faster measurements. Um, very recently, we've been looking at ideas where basically um, features of the alkaline earth atoms allow you to prepare low entropy samples in new ways. And so we've been using that to look at things like sampling problems. Uh, and finally, we've also been looking at uh, uh, potentially new architectures for quantum information processing. Um, and so in this talk, I'm actually really gonna focus on, on these two things and not too much on this, but also with skirt the boundary of this in the beginning here. Okay, so that is roughly the structure of this talk. Um, so I'm going to give you an overview of tweezer technology in general and how alkaline earths fit into that. Um, and when should I stop, actually? I just don't know when I started. Uh, like 3.30. <laughs> 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 uh, five of is probably the Five of one. one. Oh, okay. Right. Okay. Cool. Preferably. Ten of them? Cool. Um, I shouldn't know where I started. Uh, I forget where I left off. This is the outline of my talk. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, optical tweezer trapping. So the uh, I'm just going to start from the basics. Uh, I already sort of roughly said what's in this picture, um, but sort of the key point uh, of this technology is that uh, you can trap, um, you can make a light field that is localized to an intensity of much less than a mic, not much less, like less than a micron. Um, and importantly, that results in confinement of the atom such that its wave packet is 10 to 50 nanometers big. So to give you a sense of the relevant spatial scales here, 
Uh, and the way the atom is trapped, again, is just using the AC Stark shift on the atom. So there's some dominant transition typically, and the tweezer photon is red detuned from that transition. So you get an attractive potential for the atom. Uh, okay, um, so uh, that tells you how we hold on to the atoms, but how do we get the atoms in the trap? Uh, so one of the remarkable things about these setups is that this part is just very, very simple. So we make our trap, we make a laser pool cloud at atoms on the order of 10 to 10 to the five to 10 to the six atoms, and sort of 100 micron by 100 micron by 100 micron volume. Um, and then we laser pool the atoms into the tweezer. Um, when we do this, uh, something known as light assisted collisions occur. It's just the fact that the atoms feel a force as a result of some of them being excited to an optically excited state. Um, and those collisions results in just a zero or one atom being in the trap. So 50% uh, uh, of the time we'll have an atom, 50% of the time we will not, roughly. Um, and what's nice and important about this system is that uh, this gives you a path to single atoms uh, very quickly compared to alternative paths with neutral atoms, such as say evaporating a degenerate gas. Okay, so the typical uh, ingredients for our experiments look as follows. So you have an optical setup like this. Um, we use a couple different technologies for making arrays. One is using acousto-optic deflectors. Uh, and here the idea is you put some RF frequency into an acousto-optic, I'll just call them AOD. Um, and the frequency and amplitude of the, a of the RF field controls the angle and the power in the beam. Uh, and importantly, by putting many RF tones into the AOD, you can make many such traps. Uh, and those traps exist in here. Uh, and that means that at each of those locations, you might potentially have an atom when you laser pull the cloud. Um, the AODs have some very nice properties. They also have some limitations. Um, and another way of doing this is using a spatial light modulator where you just uh, directly control uh, the wavefront of the electromagnetic fields so that you can make more arbitrary uh, patterns after the microscope. Um, so this is, this is what these things might look like. Um, and uh, uh, the point is basically by engineering the optical field using the SLM or the AOD, you engineer where the atoms end up. So this is a picture of traps in our terbium experiment actually, and here are where the atoms end up. You can do other patterns uh, and you can even do things in 3D. So this is a video where we're scanning through the focus of our system. You can see it comes to a focus twice. That means you might have say like two layers of some spin system that are coupled in an interesting way. Um, good. Okay, so um, told you how we make tweezers, how we cool them, how do you detect the atoms once you have them there. So <clears throat> one thing that's very nice about these systems is that the tweezers are deep enough that you can do non-destructive detection. Um, and this is sort of a game because the traps are 10 megahertz deep, um, but you need to scatter on the order of a thousand photons. The recoil energy is about a kilohertz. So if you like, do that math in your head, John can't do it, but you guys can. <laughs> uh, you can tell that like you might get in trouble. Um, so you need to be able to cool simultaneously. Um, unfortunately, this is with many different atoms straightforward to do. Uh, and when you do this, you can see a histogram like this uh, on your camera, uh, where basically there's one peak corresponding to when you don't have atoms in your trap. Uh, and there's another peak, this bimodal distribution has another peak uh, corresponding to when you do have a single atom in your trap. And the relative area of these is roughly one to one, meaning you have a 50% chance of getting an atom in the trap. Um, uh, here are some interesting, or not interesting, here are some uh, performance you know, parameters that we typically can get in our experiments. Um, so putting this all together, here's a video of how this experiment might look. This is just showing you that we can stochastically load an array of atoms and we can image them each time. And this video is roughly actually like about the time scale of the experiments. Okay, um, so, an important fact, uh, which you were able to see in that video, is the fact that um, uh, the array has a lot of entropy. It's sort of random which trap you get an atom in. Uh, and an important innovation of the, over the past, since 2016, has been to use uh, the mobility of the tweezers to rearrange where the atoms end up. So you image them, you see where they are, you use that information to rearrange where the atoms end up, uh, and then you end up with some defect-free sample. So people have done this where you use tweezers to rearrange the positions of atoms in the tweezer array. I'll show you work that we've been doing where we use tweezers to rearrange atoms in a lattice, an optical lattice. Um, and people have done this also in 3D in Dave Weiss's group where they actually like move a lattice. So it's like you use a lattice that's like shuffling around in real time uh, to get like cubes that are defect free. Um, okay. 
So those were sort of all the things I'm gonna say about how tweezers work. Uh, if there are any questions, I can answer them now, otherwise I'll just keep going. Okay. Um, so uh, what I've not told you yet is why one might want to combine this technology with alkaline earth atoms. And so uh, here is the atomic structure of an alkaline earth atom. Alkaline earth means that the atom has uh, 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 in its valence shell two electrons. Uh, this should be contracted, contrasted with alkali atoms, which have one electron in their valence shell. And the basic point is that the atomic structure of the val of the uh, the alkali compared to the alkaline earth is a little bit different. And this difference means that we are able to do certain things that you can't do in alkali atoms. I'm not making an argument that one is better than the other. It's just new things that you can do potentially. Um, so uh, these next couple of slides are going to be me telling you how uh, this spectrum affords different capabilities. So, uh, oh yeah, one other point I want to make is that it's not just the way of these other levels, it's also the fact that the lifetimes of these levels um, uh, uh, are important as well. Okay, so um, the first thing that is different is that there's this transition here called the narrow line transition. Uh, depending on what atom you're working with, this state here has a different line width. Um, but what's nice is that it's sort of narrow in a sort of, a, uh, it's sort of in a sweet spot and that it's narrow enough that you're able to do very nice cooling. And I'll talk about that later, but it's not so narrow that you can't do that cooling quickly because you can only cool as quickly as you can scatter photons. Um, and so uh, because of this range of line widths, you can do efficient high fidelity cooling. And this impacts a number of different things that uh, many groups do with these atoms. Uh, furthermore, this, this transition here, we can use for high resolution detection. So we can simultaneously cool in this transition while we're detecting on this transition uh, and get to very low uh, uh, error in both the sense that we can detect whether we have an atom very well and furthermore do so without losing the atom. Um, and again, both of these things are, are important uh, and play a key role later in the talk. So I'm not gonna say more about it now. Okay, so the next thing is that um, certain isotopes of alkaline earths, uh, specifically the fermionic isotopes, um, have a nuclear spin. Uh, and the size of that nuclear spin depends on which atom you're working with. Uh, but one very magical atom is Euterbium-171. Uh, and I say it's magical because it has a spin one half nuclear spin. And so it's just this very natural qubit degree of freedom. Uh, and so my group has been uh, looking at this, also Jeff Thompson's group at Princeton. Um, and uh, later on in the talk, I'll, show, I'll tell you about how we can use this qubit to do fast rotations that are pretty high fidelity. Um, and furthermore, there, there are a number of features that combine with this qubit uh, that make it potentially a really nice platform for looking at things like quantum error correction with neutral atoms. Okay, so uh, I just told you about this qubit degree of freedom, um, but there's another sort of qubit-like degree of freedom, which is the so-called clock transition. So that's this transition between the single net zero state and the triple P zero state here. Uh, and the key point is that this is a very, very long lived state due to the atomic physics of this atom. Uh, but it also exists on an optical transition. So if you think of driving a transition in a sort of semi-classical sense as jiggling an electron, then basically this is uh, an electron which can live, uh, can, can oscillate for uh, a very, very long time, uh, but do so at hundreds of terahertz. So this is a ridiculously high quality factor oscillator, which is exactly the kind of thing that you want for things like timekeeping and frequency metrology. Um, uh, so we've spent a lot of time uh, uh, developing tools to control this qubit well. So these are Rabi oscillations driven on this transition. Um, and we use this both for quantum information applications, but also for metrology. Um, uh, I sort of jumped the gun earlier. The point is that this is a nice qubit, but it also is very, very, very useful for metrology. And that's actually why it's most famous. Um, okay, so the things that we've looked at with this, uh, one, we've looked at how long we can have coherence live for single atoms. Uh, in a tweezer array where the coherence is recorded in this transition here. And what we've observed is that in black here, this is the ensemble coherence for um, uh, about 160 atoms. And we can see that that lives for about 20 seconds. Uh, and we can also use single particle observables and correlation measurements to see that the single particle coherence time is actually on the order of 48 seconds. And that's sort of what we expect based on all the characterization of, of the atoms in these traps ranging from what causes them to decay to what causes them to leave the traps. Um, we can combine this, oh, it's, it's cutting off, okay. Uh, um, we can combine this with um, uh, this coherence with a, a fairly large number of atoms. 
which just means that we can do uh, uh, very precise measurements because we can have a long lever arm in an interferometry sequence and have many atoms while we do that. So this basically says that we can very quickly accrue precision, which is something known as the stability in an optical atomic clock. Um, okay, so that's, that's basically saying that this system uh, is potentially a nice platform for doing optical atomic clocks. Uh, one thing that we've been working on is combining uh, uh, Rydberg interactions with this triple P0 state. So the basic idea here is we shine a laser uh, on a transition from here to here. Uh, and this state is actually strongly interacting. So we use that as a bus to generate entanglement. Um, and what this allows us to do is generate entangled states on this optical atomic clock transition. So uh, one thing that we did so recently, this, this project was actually led by John's old student, Nathan Shine. Uh, we were able to see that we could prepare uh, for the first time Bell states on a neutral atom optical atomic clock transition. Uh, and very recently, we've been working on squeezing experiments where we work with, say, uh, arrays of like an ensemble of two by two systems or, or more and look at the uh, degree of reduced variance in a particular quadrature of the spin. And so this is ongoing uh, work in our group right now. Okay, so that's everything that I'm going to say about alkaline earths and tweezers, um, and uh, that should serve as sort of a backdrop for uh, the experiments that I'll now talk about. Uh, now would be a good time if there are any questions about those two. I'll take a sip of coffee. Uh, yeah. What is the missing compatibility for your um, oxygen entanglement? Ah, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so Sean is asking, uh, why did this go from one to minus one? Um, so the 4% of this error, we can explain from intensity noise on our laser. Um, uh, the, the Rydberg laser? The yes, the Rydberg laser. Uh, and also uh, the clock rotations. Um, but 3% we weren't able to fully explain. Yeah. Um, so that's ongoing work. Yeah. Um, but one thing that was cool was that it was definitely not limited by the phase noise on this on the river laser, which we spent a lot of time on. Um, we're suspicious that it might have to do with mechanical effects in the trap. Uh, and the fact that the atoms are like very, very, very close together for these experiments. Any other questions? All right, so um, now I'm gonna dive in on a particular thing that we've been working on over the past uh, six months or so, um, where we wanna use uh, uh, the control of this system to prepare arrays of indistinguishable atoms, and furthermore, uh, uh, use that control to uh, to set the initial conditions that the atoms sort of evolve from. Um, so uh, I want to rewind a little bit and sort of zoom out uh, to place this context, uh, place this work in sort of a broader context. And so I might sort of basically say that a lot of what we're doing is many body physics with neutral atoms, uh, and there have been two prevailing platforms for doing this, two platforms I actually already mentioned earlier, um, namely quantum gas microscopes and optical tweezer arrays. And the key idea here is that these two platforms allow you to combine scale, meaning having many, many qubits or atoms, whatever you're working with, uh, with, with control. Um, and so these systems are very different actually. So quantum gas microscopes are typically used for things like Hubbard physics, where the atoms can coherently delocalize in space. So this means you're looking at things like itinerant physics. Um, whereas tweezer arrays are, have been useful primarily for doing spin model physics. So basically, my atoms are pinned in space, they have some long range interaction, uh, and that long range interaction can encode a spin model. Um, uh, so uh, on top of the differences in the physics, they also have different um, properties associated with their sort of like performance capabilities. So quantum gas microscopes typically have thousands of atoms, and this has to do with the fact that the lattice that they're using, so it's a standing wave of light, can trap many atoms, um, whereas tweezer arrays are, are a little bit power limited and often have around 100 to hundreds of atoms. Um, the quantum gas microscopes, uh, the, the, the entropy of the sample uh, is typically not perfect as a result of the evaporative cooling that's used. So you typically have some holes in your sample, which is actually like a big problem. Uh, whereas the tweezer arrays, because you can image and then feed back, usually it's very good, like you can have a very defect-free sample. Um, the lattice geometry in the quantum gas microscopes is typically fixed by just the lattice itself, the geometry of the beams that you're using to prepare your standing wave, whereas the tweezer arrays, I just told you about all these ways that you can make different geometries of the traps. 
Um, and finally, uh, a more mon sort of mundane sounding point, but actually one that's very important, is that the quantum gas microscopes typically have life, uh, cycle times of tens of seconds. For instance, the experiment that I did my postdoc on and that John also did his postdoc on was a minute long, which is horrible. Um, whereas tweezer arrays can have uh, much less than a second cycle time. Uh, so this is really important for things like if you need to collect a ton of statistics for the thing that you're measuring. Um, so uh, uh, mindful of these points, there have been a lot of experiments which sort of try to combine, sort of like smush together these capabilities in different ways. So one example is this, this idea of known as cookie cutting, where you basically prepare some defect or like roughly defect free sample from a MOT insulator. So basically uh, a state of matter in a quantum gas microscope where you have a single atom per site, and then you project an optical potential on top of this and cut out your sample. I'll point out this is like a very expensive approach. You start with 10 to the nine atoms in your mod, then 10 to the six atoms in a Bose-Einstein condensate, and then like a hundred or so atoms in a mod insulator, and then you cut out six or 12 atoms. So it's, it's not necessarily the most efficient way to do this. Um, uh, but it can be very nice if you're trying to look at uh, uh, samples that are more likely to be defect free and also have better gaps because of the finite, of the finite size of the system. Um, Tweezers, on the other hand, uh, while they typically have been used for spin models, both in Cindy Riegel's group at JILA and also more recently we've seen Bakker's group and also in Selim Yohim's group, uh, there have been experiments where you use the fact that you can move the atoms around to make sort of more interesting coupled systems where the tweezers are actually tunnel coupled like you have in the lattice, which gives rise to this itinerance that I was referring to. The challenge with this is it can be very, very hard to balance all the tweezers in such a way that their energy, their depth rather, uh, is balanced on the scale of the tunnel, which is what you need to actually have coherent physics in the system. Okay, so uh, these are compelling approaches. They also have challenges. Let me tell you about a different approach. Oh yeah. I was gonna ask on the cookie cutting left half, uh -huh. um, the right image, it seems like it's tilted a little bit, that rectangle. Oh yeah, that's because our camera's like, has, oh, it's, it's just the camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there, there will be other images there tilted this time. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so uh, our approach, I would say, is even more brute force in the sense that we're literally just trying to smush these two technologies together. Uh, so we have an optical tweezer or an array of optical tweezers, which are uh, registered in space with an optical lattice potential. Um, I feel like I didn't actually say what an optical lattice was explicitly. When I say optical lattice, I'm referring to basically retro-reflecting a beam off a mirror it makes a standing wave of light and the atoms are separated by, uh, are trapped uh, at the, uh, uh, Amir, you'll have to help me with nodes or anti-nodes because we just had this conversation last night and I forgot which is where. One of those two, they're trapped at. Um, and, uh, uh, they're spaced by on the order of lambda over two, or lambda's the last light. Okay, uh, good. Okay, so what's nice about this, as I said, is that the lattice sites are all exactly the same depth, so you can have tunneling between them in a very coherent way. Um, uh, we work with this atom strontium 88. Uh, and so now I'm sort of moving beyond just this platform and telling you about the physics that we want to look at. And in particular, I want to highlight that this atom strontium 88 uh, has the funny property that its scattering length uh, is minus two bohr. Uh, and this is relevant because this is actually like 50 times to 100 times less than what you typically have in a, an alkali experiment. And so a lot of the physics that I'll be telling you about, you can sort of think of this atom as like effectively being a photon. Okay, it's like the other atoms don't really know about each other, um, but they're all the same. Okay, so they're, they're completely indistinguishable, or at least we try to make them indistinguishable. <laughs> the next thing I want you to have in your head is that uh, this lattice, I told you that there's tunneling in it. Um, and so you can think of the process of the atom tunneling in this lattice as sort of like a photon traversing some complicated beam splitter network. Okay, so each time that an atom hits, or sort of a photon hits a beam splitter, there's some chance it goes out one port, port some chance it goes out another port. Uh, and that's sort of like, an atom, atom tunneling from here to here, there's some chance it stays here and there's some chance it goes to the next step. Okay. All right. So one other essential ingredient for this work, which I said I would allude to earlier, is the cooling transition that we use for this atom is one in which the line width is much less than the trap frequency, meaning the characteristic oscillation frequency of an atom in a tweezer or a lattice site. Um, and what this means is that we can do something that is result sideband cooling, where we drive a transition up, and then to this excited state, triple P1, um, and then the atom decays. And because of the tight confinement, it ends up back uh, 
down here in the ground state again, but the motional state that you reduce to here is preserved. So I can cycle on this over and over again and accumulate population in the ground state. Um, uh, theoretically, what you expect is that for any axis, the motional quantum number or the average occupation that you get is quadratic in the ratio of gamma, the line width of this transition, to omega of the trap. Um, and so if you just crunch the numbers very simply, you find that you'd expect to have 98.5% ground state fraction in 3D uh, for single atoms in the experiment. Um, so this is totally essential for the work that I'm talking about now. Um, so our, putting that all together, uh, our experimental sequence looks as follows. So we load a tweezer array. This tweezer array looks awful. Um, it's disordered. The imaging that we use is terrible here. Don't worry about it. It's not how our images normally look. Um, but uh, uh, this tweezer array is overlapped with an optical lattice potential, like I said. And we can load, we can implant the atoms from this tweezer array into this lattice potential. Uh, and this is a picture here where we've taken many runs of our experiment where we just move this lattice slowly across the, sorry, move the tweezer array slowly across the lattice. Uh, and this is just showing you that there are many, many sites that we potentially could load. It's the only, this is useful experimentally, it's just instructive for seeing the underlying correlations of the lattice. Um, so what we do is then we load from some configuration of the tweezer array uh, into the lattice. We see where the atoms are by imaging them. And then we rearrange the atoms in the, the lattice using the tweezers. And so we can make images like these. So this is an array of uh, doublets where the atoms are on uh, nearest neighbor sites. Uh, this is a, uh, a rearranged array where the atoms are on every other site. This was the creative thing that the group decided to do of having uh, strontium-88 pointing at a strontium-88 atom. Uh, this sort of illustrates like how we're doing this in arbitrary uh, configurations. We make these little reservoirs above and below and pull atoms from the top and the bottom to avoid bringing atoms past each other, which we find can drag the atoms out of the sites. Um, uh, I can tell you how well we can do this and stuff if people have questions. Um, uh, once the atoms are implanted in the lattice, we do this resolved sideband pooling and we see spectra like these. Uh, and the main thing that I want you to understand about this spectrum is that this peak over here corresponds to when we would drive a transition that would flip the spin, the electronic spin, and or uh, yeah, flip, cause a transition in the electronic degree of freedom uh, and further add emotional quantum. Uh, that's this here. Uh, the center thing is where we don't talk to the motion. But then over here is where that transition for reducing the emotional quantum number would exist. But because the atom is in the ground state, we can't drive it. So we can use this asymmetry to infer that we have a 95% 3D, 3D ground state fraction. Um, we then allow the atoms to tunnel in whatever configuration we prepared them in uh, and detect where they end up. Okay, so as a warm up, we can do this with just single atoms. So we implant an atom in the center of the lattice where this little circle is. Uh, and then we run the experiment many times. This is a video of the experiment running many times. Uh, and then if we accrue a density distribution, what we see is exactly what we'd expect from the single particle band structure of the system. So this is just saying that the single atoms tunnel in this lattice and interfere in exactly the way you'd expect for their wave function evolving in the system. Okay, that's good. Um, we can do this in 2D as you just saw and go to larger and larger system sizes where the atoms are delocalized over about 200 sites. Um, uh, uh, this is interesting in part because um, the, uh, the fast cycle time that we have here means that we could do this in say like 50,000 shots per day, which would be very difficult to do in, in a quantum gas microscope system. Um, and also we can do many experiments in parallel by putting the atoms where we want and just make sure they don't overlap. Um, and then finally, um, I told you about how we can prepare the distribution of the atoms to begin with. We can actually also modify their, the single particle unitary in real time as they evolve. Um, this is uh, something that we use to realize this protocol by Andrew Childs for spatial search. I'm not gonna talk about that today, but if I have a meeting, we can discuss it further if you're interested. Okay, so that tells you that the single particle physics seems to be okay. Um, so the next thing that we wanna do um, is understand how well we've prepared the atoms. Uh, and one way of doing that is asking how similar are two independently prepared atoms? That is, how indistinguishable are they? Um, if they were not indistinguishable in this case, that might be because they are in a mixed state, which would say that there's some entropy in the density matrix that we've uh, uh, achieved for each of these single atoms. Um, so in photonics, one way that people look at addressing such a question is by doing something known as Hangu-Mendel interference. Uh, 
Um, so I'm going to take a second to explain that and then tell you how uh, we use this kind of interference in our experiments. So in Hange Mendel interference of photons, you have a photon in, put, uh, photon in on one port of a beam splitter, a photon in another port of a beam splitter. And uh, due to a, a two particle path interference, the photons always come out the same port. So this is like flipping two coins over and over again and finding that they always land the same way, but which way they land is random. Um, uh, and this is not due to any sort of interactions between the atoms, this is just, or the photons, this is just due to the fact that they're indistinguishable. Um, and so you can understand this very simply. Uh, if you look at the possible two particle paths, you can focus in on these two here. There's one in which both atoms are uh, transmitted and one in which they're both reflected. And this configuration has a minus sign with respect to this one. So they coherently cancel and go away, leaving only this one in four configuration where the particles come out the same port. Uh, so this is represented, or sorry, this was observed in 1987 by Hong Wu and Mandel. Um, and this is a, a very famous plot. And the key point is that as you move this beam splitter here, uh, there's a position at which the photons are perfectly overlapped in their arrival time on the beam splitter. And you get the so-called Hong Wu Mandel dip which says that the coincidence counts, the likelihood that I get a photon out on this port and this port at the same time dips to some small value. And that small value tells you how indistinguishable the photons are. Okay, so how can we use that in our experiment? So uh, on the one hand, we wanna measure uh, some sort of indistinguishability or like bunching, the fact that the photons come out the same port, in our case, atoms. Uh, but what I haven't told you yet is that we can't do that. So like, it's very difficult for us to measure more than one atom at a site due to these light assisted collisions that I alluded to earlier in my talk. Um, if there are questions about that, I can talk about it, but just take that as a given. Um, and so we can't measure multiple atoms, but at the same time, indistinguishability is manifest in wave function overlap. So what to do? <clears throat> so Aaron Young, who's the lead student on this project, had a very, very clever idea. Uh, which is as follows. So in 2D, um, we can have uh, uh, many more modes than we have atoms. And in particular, you can calculate what's the likelihood that two atoms end up on the same site. And you want to be in a condition where M, the number of modes, is much greater than N squared, where N is the number of atoms. Um, but you can analyze your data in a projected space in 1D. And what I mean by that is basically this system that I'm going to tell you about, this 2D lattice, is separable. So it doesn't really matter uh, like there's no coupling between one dimension and another dimension. So I can just project my analysis into one dimension of the trap. Um, and what that means is that in 1D, I can see bunching, right? I could end up with two atoms in the same column, but they're not necessarily on the same site in real space. So I can see the bunching physics without having to deal with the fact that I don't want atoms to the same site. Um, so this is how this experiment looks. We'll prepare two atoms on neighboring sites and we'll let them go. We'll see something like this. This is the density distribution. Uh, but as I said, we're going to analyze this data in the sort of 1D projected space. So we start with a distribution like this. So this is the number of atoms in each column of this figure to begin with. Um, and then it evolves to something more complicated. Um, and when we make a correlation map, so this is the, this, the x axis and y axis here are, uh, are telling you the likelihood that you measure a particle uh, at x2 and x1. Uh, you see things like this. So uh, for instance, if you focus up here, uh, this is the input configuration. So we have a high likelihood of having uh, a point here. That is a point where uh, there's an atom at x2 equals four and x2 equals five. Good. Uh, and that matches the theory of the off. <laughs> um, so then you wait some amount of time and then you find that in that input configuration that you began with, the atoms and neighboring sites, there's some time for which the likelihood to measure the particles there goes away. So that, that probability just disappears. Um, this smells a lot like hung mandel interference uh, in the sense that this one one configuration that you began with is suddenly being suppressed at some particular time. Uh, and we can check this intuition by preparing atoms in this configuration where now they're no longer in the same row or same row yeah, to begin with. And so they're distinguishable in the, in the row degree of freedom. Think of that as a label. Uh, and when we do that, we see that the probability to find the atoms uh, in that configuration of one atom in each row, uh, the input rows, uh, is restored. Okay? And so uh, uh, this sounds right, but you can think of this another way, which I think is sort of the more helpful way of thinking about it. So we have this in input configuration that looks like this. <laughs> and then we have this output uh, where there are all these different paths that the single atoms might go. right? And those correspond to all these possible different configurations that the atoms might end up in. Um, 
Uh, and I'm asking the question of what is the likelihood that they end up in this configuration here, right? Um, and the point then is that we want to just ignore all of these other paths because none of them gives this configuration. And we can just focus on this configuration right here. And we can ask the question, what are the quantum amplitudes for each of these different paths? And so for the path in which both atoms stay where they started, it's sort of like both atoms being trans both photons being transmitted in the Hamamental effect, uh, you have a one and a one. Not, not too complicated. But then if they tunnel, then you actually get a phase factor of I. Um, and so in the two particle paths, then I have a one times a one and an I times an I, which is mass John can definitely do. Uh, and that tells you that basically you end up with no population in this output configuration. Okay, so it just coherently goes away. Um, by contrast, if I had distinguishable particles, so I had like a blue particle and a green particle, um, then the configuration one and configuration two for an atom on neighboring sites uh, and the input configuration, those don't coherently interfere because they're just distinguishable. So then you don't get this effect. And that's what's happening here. Okay, <clears throat> so we can use this to extract the purity, how well we prepared these atoms. Um, this is based on, okay, that's blocking Sean's face, or you can see Sean's <laughs> face here. That's Sean Geller uh, at NIST, who spent a lot of time sort of formalizing these intuitions for us. Uh, and we're able to see that we have 96% single particle purity uh, in this preparation procedure that I was just talking about. Um, so the way we do this is just by taking the ratio of the indistinguishable outcomes to the distinguishable ones. And this gives us a, a proper normalization for just the statistical chance that we might end up with one one uh, on that site for, for, for distinguishable particles. Okay, so two particles is, is good, but what we'd like to do, and what I'll tell you in the remainder of this talk, I won't get to the third section of my talk, um, is uh, going to more particles. Um, and so I wanted to just take a second to illustrate why this is actually complicated. I told you these are non-interacting systems. So like most people will tell you like, don't waste your time doing that. But there's sort of interesting physics here. So um, I talked about this two particle case, but now imagine the many particle case. So I have this initial configuration of atoms like this and some final configuration like this. And we can ask the question, what is, uh, what is the chance that I go from here to here uh, under evolution of this system? And there's, uh, and there's some single particle unitary uh, uh, that governs this that tells you the likelihood that a particle on site J scatters to site K. Um, so there's uh, this set of paths, there's this set of paths, there's this set of paths, and there are actually n factorial possible paths here. Um, and the key point is that each of these paths uh, the number of paths that you have grows with the number of modes and number of particles that you have. Uh, and furthermore, they all coherently interfere because of the fact that the atoms are indistinguishable. Um, so this um, can be calculated based on calculating this very complicated matrix, uh, and in particular the permanent of that matrix. Um, and what it turns out is that for particular kinds of U, uh, the single particle unitary, um, this is a very hard problem in like a computer science sense. Um, and don't ask me more about that because I, I won't be a, I won't be um, But this is a, a, a formal fact based on something from Scott Aronson, uh, and in particular, it's the physics of boson sampling, which you might have heard of, heard of, but in the context of photons. Um, so uh, yeah, so there have been a lot of experiments where basically you make these gargantuan beam splitter networks. I think Amir at some point said to me very insightfully that this would be the picture that motivates all of integrated photonics for the next 10 years. Um, and the point is that the, uh, uh, if I have, uh, yeah, this, this network, the output distribution is hard to calculate. There've been experiments with 14 photons and 60 modes, uh, the Fox states and also with squeeze states, 70 states and 100 modes. The squeeze state physics is a bit, a bit more complicated and frankly controversial. Um, so why would you want to do this with atoms? Um, so, uh, I told you about how we now have pretty on-demand preparation of single atom box states. Um, the evolution of the atoms in this network is, is basically lossless. So for like most time scales relevant for what I'm about to show you, we don't see loss. Um, <clears throat> and we have very high fidelity parallel detection of the atoms. So these are things that in some cases are hard to come by in a photonic context. Um, okay. So we want to go to later times and more particles. Later times here really means more modes. So we can look at two particle distributions at late times and see correlation maps like this. Um, I don't want you to gather too much from this other than it seems like things work as we go to late times. Uh, we can go to larger numbers of rearranged systems. Uh, but the thing is, we don't really know what to measure. So if I have eight particles on this input configuration, 
even in this projected space of eight particles on 15 nodes, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of potential output configurations. So even with this fast cycle time, we couldn't hope to sample this distribution effectively. Um, but if we back up and look at smaller samples to begin with, we can use this as a uh, sort of inspiration for what we might want to look at. So um, in particular, if we sort of go to um, uh, the sort of like next step in dimension of correlation maps in 3D, so what's the probability that I have a particle at x1, x2, and x3, you still see along this diagonal that the atoms are more likely to end up near each other. This is just sort of bosonic interference, but in this many particle case now. Um, so let's sort of focus in on that. So one thing that we could look at is just the likelihood that the particles end up in the exact same mode. <clears throat> and here's a plot of us measuring that. And we're comparing the indistinguishable case compared to the distinguishable case. Uh, and there's this nice theory paper from 2013 that shows that for any single particle unitary, uh, the indistinguishable chance of the, the probability of bunching for indistinguishable particles is n factorial enhanced over distinguishable particles. Um, that is like, in second quantization, I think fairly intuitive, just I have this n, root n factorial amplitude associated with adding a particle where there are already n minus one part or n particles. Um, and uh, for distinguishable particles, you don't have that. So you have this enhancement in the bunching amplitude, uh, root n factorial and amplitude and factorial and probability. <clears throat> we can also ask the question, what is the like likelihood that the atoms end up in the same contiguous region? This is something known as clouding that comes out of the photonics community. Um, and here too, we see that the indistinguishable data uh, has a much enhanced clouding uh, feature compared to distinguishable atoms. Um, and we can see that up to n equals eight, we can actually do theory beyond here. Uh, actually, we might, we might actually now be able to do that, but when we first made these plots, we couldn't. Um, and so uh, uh, what we've more recently been doing is basically uh, trying to realize this idea from this protocol from someone named Valery Chechnovich from 20, uh, he has this, from 2016, which basically says the following. I can choose any random collection of sites and I can ask the question, what is the likelihood that all of my particles end up in those sites? Uh, conversely, I can ask what's the likelihood that no particles end up in the complement of that set of sites. Um, and what uh, uh, this paper shows is that that probability is maximized for the case of indistinguishable particles compared to distinguishable particles. And I think actually is minimized for fermions. Um, and so uh, one way of thinking about this is basically that the bunching causes, makes it more likely that atoms will sit on the same site. So it seems more likely then that I would have a particular set of sites where all the atoms might end up. Um, uh, the bunching and the clouding features that I just told you about are a specific cho choice of the set of sites, namely K, that's like a set of sites. Um, don't worry about this. Um, so <clears throat> what we do is we rearrange the atoms into some configuration of interest we randomly choose some set of sites, and then we ask the question, what is the likelihood that no atoms end up in the, that choice of sites? Um, and what we find is that uh, the likelihood for this probability P empty uh, is enhanced for indistinguishable particles, again, over distinguishable particles, and furthermore ma matches a simulated sampling uh, algorithm that we're now using uh, uh, pretty well. Um, and furthermore, the well, this is sort of redundant information, but it's just showing you that the difference between these two matches what you'd expect. Um, so, uh, what that row? Oh, sorry. So, focus on this axis. Rho is the density, and it's, it's sort of actually um, the, the density here is a little bit funny because it the atoms are delocalized over many sites, right? So, it's sort of like we can't fix a boundary. So, I think a more meaningful axis to add here. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Actually, it's blocked up. Another question? Uh, sorry. Okay. So this is again a nice check that things are doing what we expect. Um, now we can look at a situation where we scale up to 180 atoms. And uh, we actually no longer enforce perfect rearrangement. So for all the previous data that I was showing you, we actually didn't post select and having the correct number of atoms in our initial rearrangement. Uh, and here, uh, or, sorry. In our previous data, we did do that. In this data, we no longer do that. Um, so showing you some images of what the experiment looks like when we do post-select and realizing now that this narrative is a little confusing. Uh, it looks like this, so we prepare without the atoms tunnel doing this. Um, uh, it looks like this. Um, and what we want to do is compare to a case in which we, we deliberately construct a distinguishable distribution from which we can do simulated sampling. 
by doing the following. So we prepare an array like this, which is smaller than the number of atoms that I was showing you up here, right? Um, but we can go to different positions to start and then use that as an effective label that we uh, 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 think of as like a distinguishing label for the atoms. So these different experiments occur at different times. So the atoms are distinguishable among those experiments, but we can incoherently add these distributions to simulate the effect of distinguishability. Uh, and the way we're able to do this is by being able to shift where we implant the atoms in the lattice. Um, and so we, when we do this, we find uh, something that is encouraging, which is that this, this, this metric that I was telling you about drops as we add more and more labels, that is, as we add more and more distinguishability to the experiment. Um, and we can also look at just the likelihood of getting some number of atoms surviving at the end, where the fact that the atoms don't survive is a result of this bunching that I was saying that turns into, uh, we have this parity projection problem. And we see again that the, the atom survival um, uh, uh, sort of shifts in a way that we would expect. And furthermore, we can do a simulated uh, calculation for the case of distinguishable atoms up to nine labels that also show decent agreement. Okay. So um, the outlook here, um, which I guess will just be the outlook of my talk, um, is that uh, uh, this is an interesting system um, and one can ask how big can we realistically go? Um, uh, for these two particle experiments, we showed 96% purity. Um, and uh, one can ask if I have 50 atoms, what purity would I expect just from that? And that would be 12% for the many particle distribution. Um, uh, uh, we can further go to 200 modes. So this is like pretty competitive, but for boxes with photonic experiments. Um, I would say that for us, um, uh, or at least, yeah. So I, I'm not personally so invested in doing like a supremacy experiment, which a lot of people are interested in these, in this context. It's more just asking the question in this minimally complicated situation, how do you verify that you know what you're doing? Um, that's you know, a lot of people are thinking about this and this is a different system in which to explore that question. Um, one could also imagine switching isotopes, which we can do fairly easily, to one which is interacting. Uh, and then you'd have Bose Hubbard physics. Um, uh, and there's some very interesting ideas for measuring entanglement in these systems. Uh, and some of my earlier work in my postdoc, uh, we were limited in what we could do as a result of the statistics that we could gather. And now we could have a much higher rep rate to go to larger systems to measure entanglement. Um, and uh, one could even imagine switching, switching isotopes and doing fermions. Okay. So that is uh, the end of that section of that talk. I have uh, two minutes. Uh, I went a lot slower than that. Um, maybe I'll just, uh, let's see. Maybe I'll just stop actually. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, let me just actually acknowledge the group. So, uh, uh, all of the strontium work here was, all, all the work I talked about was actually the strontium team in the end, uh, which was, uh, uh, includes Aaron Young, uh, Nelson, Darkwa Pong, Will Eckner, and Alex Sal. Um, uh, this is a utopian team, but unfortunately I didn't talk about the work. So, thanks. Um, so I think a good first question is, uh, what did I do to deserve your ire? <laughs> do, do we have uh, I mean, what didn't you do? Yeah, well, yeah. well, how difficult is it to stabilize your lattice to the tweezer uh, mechanically? Yeah, so um, for the 2D lattice, so we it's actually 3D, so we have confinement in this third direction here. Um, in 2D, we uh, the images that we do are uh, of the atoms in the lattice. And so those images tell us where the lattice is. And uh, we can actually use that to feed back on the tweezers uh, in a well-calibrated fashion to ensure that they're always aligned to the lattice sites. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for the hollow level effect, um, you say that the reason we don't see two things in the same site is due to interference. Um, what would be different if it said they were, say, distinguishable particles that just had strong interactions with each other? So distinguishable particles with strong interactions. They were to repel each other. Yeah, so uh, one way of thinking about this is that uh, then it would be off resonance for an atom, for a configuration where the atoms are like this to one in which they're like this, uh, because the interactions shift the energy of the state. 
So if then in this sort of two level system picture of this versus this, uh, I also would have this by symmetry, right? Um, uh, uh, I need J to be uh, uh, much greater than U in order to observe the physics, which is why in this case, we can largely ignore U because it's so small. But if U were bigger than J, then it would actually suppress this effect. And I would have to bias the two wells in order to see this phenomenon happen. So um, I guess to, to do this in large amount of rates, you need like the UIJs to be very well defined between uh, like, I guess, homogeneous over your whole system. Yeah, so one thing, yeah. So we've spent a lot of time in this and I actually decided not to talk about it. Not that that made any difference in the time scale of my talk. Um, <laughs> but uh, so one thing that we're doing based on this protocol from um, a photonics paper is you can, you can do a two particle interference experiment where basically one, one atom serves as a phase reference for the other atom. And you can use that to back out the underlying distribution of the lattice. Um, and so actually for this, this, the preliminary stuff that I was showing, all of that draws on the inferred unitary using that protocol. So just to go through every site and count it, uh, like measure this. Yeah, we, we, we do, we sample from two particles and use that to infer what we would expect. And you actually have to do that plus the single particle analog, just like the single atom. Any questions? Um, in your like analogy between like, like photons and atoms, and you say you have like 200 modes, what, um, uh, maybe, maybe it's obvious, but like, what are, what do your modes correspond to? Yeah, I actually meant to say that. And I realized later in the talk that I had not said it. So in, in this case, the mode are just, the modes are just the lattice sites. Okay. So like I can, I can go through a beam splitter and end up on one output port or another output port. Uh, in the tunneling case, I can, uh, stay in one site or end up in the next site. And so the site is the analog of the modes. The things that are coupled are, are sites versus modes. I have a uh, related question, which is um, I'm going to draw more ire. <laughs> <laughs> it should be a softball, but you may or may not be able to handle it. This is this is for those of you who are wondering. This is what it means to be a good host. <laughs> um, so, so you made this comment that basically you can do a two D walk but average one of the dimensions no. out as long as they start in the same like row. Uh, the, that, that statement is, is not contingent on them starting in the same row. They can start in different rows. What, it, what underlies that is the fact that the Hamiltonian is separable. Yeah, so I guess I, the question I was gonna ask is about disorder. Do you get to average out the disorder or are you more sensitive to disorder? Um, it's also not a <laughs> question. Um, uh, so we have considered the effect of diagonal tunneling, which definitely would break this, right? Because then you have non-separability. Um, and you're asking if I have disorder. I would actually think that because this is an on-site potential, um, which doesn't explicitly break the separability, that that does not matter. But I want to think about it a little bit more and write it out. That's my guess. And then a related question is, if you prepare them distinguishably mm -hmm. and then you project, mm -hmm. if you don't get them yet, right? Mm -hmm. But is there some sense in which you could might measure in some diagonal, project diagonally or something? Uh, no, because you don't have it's direct tunneling yet. Yeah, yeah. Right. In that, exactly. Oh, that's another cool. way of thinking about it. Yeah. That's right. Cool. I have a question about this slide. Who's Basil? Oh, Basil's my dog. One of two dogs. <laughs> um, okay, so um, let's thank Adam again for this. Which is, um, is there a possibility? Well, okay, along this one, I'm going to press you.